gonna turn this thing off. What's up, everybody? Welcome to uh, what's the name of the show? Advanced Soil and Cannabis Education. <laughs> uh, this episode we have um, Heston Alcorn, um, kind of an internet buddy of mine, um, and we're gonna be talking about uh, kind of some advanced cultivation techniques. You know, some like DIY approaches, some uh, living soil regenerative concepts, and like the science behind them. Um, this is a show I've been looking forward to. I know that you guys have been looking forward to it too. Um, we had to reschedule it in the past, but now we are here. Heston, what's up, man? How you doing? Doing well, thanks. Uh, we're just surviving the little uh, coastal snowstorm here and wishing for spring. We've got a couple of large outdoor plots that I'm going to start working on for uh, actually a blueberry production and. Uh, yeah, lots, lots going on. Hur hurry up and wait for spring at this point, I think, just like everyone Dude, I'm, else. I'm itching for springtime, man. I'm I'm ready for it. I'm ready for spring. That's awesome. I, like, it, it got all weird... like... Go ahead, sorry. No, you go, you go ahead. Okay. Um, it got <laughs> warm here and things started to sprout and I got super excited and like birds are like coming around and then it snowed, you know, like inches. And I was like, fuck, I was like, stop, please, please stop. <laughs> bring me spring no, I, yeah no i same same way we had a horrible ice storm a few weeks ago uh and everything you know, it was it was below freezing for days which is rare for us here on the coast and then as soon as it got it back above 40 degrees everything started coming out and go back in back in another freezing spell so yeah it's interesting i, I the county where we are in here on the coast uh actually prevents us from if we have a if you're a medical uh if you're a medical patient here in state, you cannot grow outdoors in this county. For if you had four rec plants, I could grow outside. So I don't, I don't get to grow outdoors uh, where I'm at, and I have a tough time finishing, uh, nice. even if I did. So it'll be nice to get a uh, some some edibles, out, the edible fruits and edible plants out to to enjoy growing and take advantage of some space I had to open up from the wildfire we had a couple of years ago. So try to silver lining with that and. Um, yeah, just look, looking forward to spring. Cool. You said you're planting blueberries, and what else are you doing? Blueberries, uh, blueberries, some cherry and apple trees, but primarily uh, uh, high bush blueberries do extremely well here on the coast with very minimal uh, watering, which is we're on a well, a low production well here, so that is always an issue, a limiting issue for for what we can do outside. So we're trying to find, uh, you know, the zero scape type of plants and native species of grass and wildflowers and uh, try to you know try to work with a very low uh, low water input situation so blueberries is one of the fruits that produces really well lasts a very long time and uh, you, we could be able to get away with very minimal uh, inputs on it cool awesome you we have uh, a lot of blackberries around here and kind of a pain in the ass but good info. oh yeah the right. thorn, the thorny type, the yeah, yeah. yeah same, same yeah. here. It yeah. was, uh, which is uh, it's nice because they are they're delicious and they're, mm -hmm. you don't have to do anything. They're an invasive species, so they grow very yeah. well on they their just, own. They grow very well. Yeah, yeah. yeah they thrive. Have you ever, uh, you ever fermented any of them before? Oh, definitely. That's that's one of the few, fer like K and F style sugar ferments. I I will still do. Like I said, like FAA. Um, and blackberry growth tips is just awesome because they are, uh, if no one is familiar with them, they're an invasive species. They grow unbelievably fast. Uh, they're very prolific. They're, they're spread or, uh, spread through rhizomes in the ground. So they're almost impossible to dig up and kill off. Uh, but one of the, the, like the benefits of them is they are an incredibly fast growing plant. So those, uh, growth tips are something I like to harvest in the spring when they really take off growing and, and do a, uh, batch of, of ferments with those yeah fermenting growth tips is a is a cool little piece of information um that i'm not sure if everyone knows about um we can we can start there we can talk about that um yeah capturing it. yeah cap capturing those phytohormones and that's something i i'm not sure how well is carried over in some of the jadam preparations where there's you know that extended putrefication process that would go on for months perhaps but the knf ferment is you know five seven nine days at the most and you're able to use that relatively quickly so i feel like especially if you're trying to 
not necessarily capture the nutritional profile, but some of the phytohormones, uh, mm -hmm. some of the active biology that's there. So I think that KNF very quick turnaround is probably more uh, beneficial on that side. And something I, I want to try for the first time this this season is so like the the old think of like the wine or the grapevine stock the the old gnarly stock that exists and you prune that back every year so that's kind of the way we have done it, a few of these uh blackberry little growth little patches that we we don't eradicate because we eat them but we prune them back quite a bit every year and there's a couple that i'm going to take out and the the stalks you know very beefy stalks and after a spring rain and where they're growing uh very fast and they're in a, a peak you know veg growth state if you will uh, any kind of any pruning you do, those those branches bleed and they lose. Uh, and I want to start harvesting the large stalks and just blending those and doing like a, an aloe vera tea almost with them and, and just uh, blend them up and strain them because the you know the, one of those three inch stalks is transporting enough you know waters, minerals, phytohormones coming from the roots, the growth tips for uh, you know maybe a ten by ten by ten foot area a biomass of plant so just like my intuition is that that is you know that large stock is going to be concentrated with with all, all the stuff that we're after in the growth tips on its way to the growth tips so um, mm -hmm. experimenting yeah. on how yeah how to better use the, the stuff that's naturally around and and not necessarily in a, a brown sugar ferment situation i do uh, you know throw uh, anytime I'm pruning the blackberries in the summer, I'll throw them in a 50 gallon drum uh, of Jadam uh, liquid fertilizer. But like I said, I think that's more on the side of, you know, of capturing all the minerals and, and the nutrients as opposed to the active phytohormones or anything that would be potentially degrading in that environment over months and months of, of time. Right. Because those, those phytohormones, they can be really, uh, you know, they're sensitive. They're, they're volatile. Right. And like, exposed to too much oxygen or just, you know, degradation through putrefaction or just exposure to different biology and stuff. They're going to, they're going to break them down. They're not going to stick around, you know, um, uh, which is one of the reasons why I like doing the blending and straining, like you had mentioned. Um, I am curious whether or not that mechanical agitation, you know, what it does to the molecules. I mean, they're so small, like who knows? And a lot of these mm -hmm. things, you know, we're kind of just, um, pursuing based on like, uh, I guess, intuition or instinct or having like a relative understanding of how these things work. Um, and then them making scientific sense and then we implement them, but actually knowing for sure is, is really difficult. Um, and so we can speculate, um, but what we can do and what we can see is the physiological response, um, you know, in our plants, like for sure, like I have used, um, you know, the premature blackberry FPJ before, and there was 100% a physiological response in my plants. Um, and it even seemed like they tasted more like berry um, after really? using it, you know? And, um, you know, so we we know that like premature growth, you know, like the cells are a little bit smaller, right? So when we have like a whole bunch of premature growth, we have smaller cells, we have like more density of cells, more density of like nutrients, more density of organic acids instead of when they kind of swell up with more water and stuff like that. Um, so it's like, more concentrated, right? So we use like fresh growth tips, we use premature apples, premature blackberries and stuff like that. Like we know that we have more density of uh, just phytochemicals in general, whether they be just the wide broad profile of organic acids to nutrients, to enzymes and stuff, like it's gonna just be more concentrated in like a premature growth or like a new growth, right? Um, I liked what you were talking about with like using the juices um, I've heard of some people like taking, um, I think they're called spiles, a spile. Do you know what a spile I don't, is? I don't know. So it's a thing that no. you like hammer into a tree and like it'll melt. Oh, no, for sure, tree. like maple syrup. Yeah, like maple syrup or, or just like to extract like the water from it, right? Like in a survival setting. Okay. Um, and people will collect the juices from like a tree and then feed mm -hmm. it to their plants. Um, which obviously you don't want to overdo it. You don't want to kill your tree. Um, but that I find that really interesting also, because it's going to be all the nutrients that have already been made available through the root zone inside the plant. So it's like you're using, 
you're, you're you're skipping this the portion of of like you know root exudates communicate well not communicating but catalyzing um reactions in the soil it's already inside the plant in the form that the plant needs it's it's um, being distributed to be used it's 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 in available form ready to go that's yeah, yeah, exactly exactly perfect and so i'm almost wondering if maybe like using s relative species like species of plants that are like related to each other um like a mint or something you know like how cannabis is, is in like the mint family um like using mint uh as like a way to like use nutrients for like cannabis or something like that or or finding stuff that's just in like the relative family of the cannabis or just cannabis itself um and yeah. like cannibalizing it and feeding it to itself but definitely mint I would be a great cool. one if that if that offered enough benefits that grows like it's so easy uh, to propagate and it spreads and it, it's very hardy so that would be something you could harvest continuously to it'd be a good like oh, yeah. input, input crop it's, just to grow for the sake of having it as an input another one of those rhizome uh growing plants you know that you they're impossible to get rid of which is oh, it's, it's wild yeah yeah but it's cool it's fun mint it's easy but i've never actually tried that but it's just kind of an idea that i've had um uh, but yeah, I've been I've been kind of trying to stay away from FPJs and stuff, um, and I've kind of been leaning more towards FPEs. I was a big fan of FPJs, um, and they work. And you know, I'm I'm sure that I'll continue making them in the future. Um, but I've been doing a lot of like FPEs lately. Um, have you made very many FPEs? Not many at all. No, and um, I do love. Uh labs it, it makes mm -hmm. sense right it is it, di, di, it's like fast forwarding the putrefication process almost right it's it's condensing that jadam prep well, preparation down into a much shorter time frame well it's interesting actually because it won't break down the plant matter um oh no i no. thought it was fully digested like you get at the no. end of a jadam it almost like pickles okay. it okay so yeah, like no when I, you're I, I know i see yeah, so like when you're done making like an FP FPE, everything is in like its full original form that you put it in there, but it's like pale. It's like lacking. Oh. It's just like almost empty, right? Like it's like a shell, like the skeleton of what it was. Um, but then you can take that, and if you take that and you like throw it on compost, it breaks down like super fast. Oh, um, sure. And people will That's even awesome. take that that pulp after the fermentation process and top dress their plants with it, like their soil. Obviously you don't want it around like the base of the stock. Um, and it'll break down super quickly. And people have claimed that it has like, I've never tried it, but I will this year. Um, we had a guy on here who's talking about doing it. And he said that he sees more of a drastic response using the fermented pulp of an FPE than actually using the liquid itself. Huh. Um, just, it breaks down super quickly. Worms eat it really quickly. Um, uh, yeah, I forget exactly what we said. God, they forget who it was who said it too. And, and no, I just had it in my I just had it in my mind because of the labs that it was it was actually fully digested, and that's one of the reasons it kind of started to turn me off from the K and F ferments. Is like you, you're left over with all that plant matter, right? Mm -hmm. It's like it's it's so you're you're leaving you know leaving money on the table. And I the, one of the things I do appreciate for the Jadam is like if you let it go long enough, it's just a bucket of liquid. It's all been like completely digested, broken down, uh, er every last bit of you know cellulose that was available to be in the plant is now in the water, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, it just takes so long. Yeah, just it's it's a it's a process that a lot of people don't want to make that months long commitment. Uh, yeah, but I think it's it's definitely worth. It. So I know you do a lot of jadam. I've I've never done jadam. <laughs> um, yeah, it's I've, I've started. Started, yeah, started really transitioning away because I, you know, get into KNF, you know, organic, uh, start being more mindful of sourcing inputs. And then you just like start to kind of uh, critique yourself uh, more and more of like, what else can I do? And then it's like really brown sugar. I was buying so much brown sugar and like it's not local anywhere. I'm bringing this in, you know, uh, I never got to the point where I was buying bananas at the store, but I, I kind of could see it go in that direction. Which you know, I know, and that's the other thing is I don't want to act, don't talk down to people doing that because if your choice is buying a bottle of synthetic nutrients or going buying 
fruit at the grocery store to make preparations. Obviously, I support you going and buying fruit and making it yourself, but uh, kind of the whole idea behind those, you know, the philosophy behind KNF and Jadam is always like use what you have locally. What what do you have in your area that you can process yourself with minimum uh, outside inputs, minimum money spent to process that into plant available nutrients? And really, Jadam is just whatever scraps you have with some leaf mold and water, and you're going to have fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So that's what really draws me to the process is that it really is. It's like, <clears throat> it really is whatever you can scrounge. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of uh, ratios people, you know, suggest like your, your bloom ferment, your, your uh, veg ferment. And this is, you know, again, a lot of intuition out there. Uh, and I'm just as guilty as, you know, okay, veg, it's obviously going to want a bunch more nitrogen. So put a bunch of more green leafy matter in the, in the bucket to putrefy or uh, all the uh, defoliation leaves is a great one. It's just like, you know, straight pruned and defoliated cannabis bucket. So there's mm -hmm. not much diversity in that preparation, right? So it's, you want to call it a veg specific. It's not a full spectrum. And I hate those terms as well because, uh, I don't really think it's a great description of, of what we're trying to accomplish. And at, and at the end of the day, I think people are hesitant to try out some of these uh, do, do it yourself crafting your own inputs because they're so used to having a, a very easy to see NPK values on everything. Mm -hmm. Everything is measured precisely and exactly, especially in synthetics. Uh, you, you can really control each element that's going into it. And then all of a sudden now you're just like, throwing kitchen scraps into a bucket and that's going to grow your plant. It's kind of a clash of philosophies and a clash of what we have been told is possible, isn't possible and, and what's necessary uh, as a grower by primarily by, you know, marketing from fertilizer sales, right? They, they're the ones that right. push the agenda of you can only have success with our product. And that's kind of the backbone of uh, any and all fertilizer. Sorry. Uh, if you're selling fertilizer, it's like that's your goal is to sell fertilizer, not to teach people about the carbon cycle. Uh, not that's not fair. Or anything, but right. it, it's it's a fertilizer. So whatever. At the end of the day, it's a personal preference, and some people just don't care. They just don't care. Uh, some people aren't, aren't interested in uh, you know trying out living soil. Uh, we got my my friend Preston is a plumber up in Canada. And I don't know if you follow him, but uh, he has one of the most beautiful homegrown basement setups. It's all hydroponic, uh, recirculated, deep water culture, I believe. And every he's a plumber by trade, so like every pipe is perfect, exactly <laughs> parallel. It's like a beautiful. It's a, it's like a work of art. It really is. It's gorgeous. And he's a plumber. That's his thing. He likes to do plumbing shit and put all the nice. pipes and pumps and valves and <laughs> yeah. all that stuff is is like cool to him. And to me, it's overwhelming. Like I would never attempt to grow that style just because it's I you know i'm not a plumber i don't know it it's not appealing to me i'm a you know dirt guy so it's it's appealing to me to have this system yeah. that's like self-sustaining and mimic as Biology. much as i can that outdoor mm -hmm. yeah and you know i know it's you know and that's another thing is growing indoors under artificial light you know is that even organic uh you know but like i said i don't have an option legally to, to grow outdoors uh, and a lot of people don't have the option just like geographically to have a successful outdoor harvest. So the reality is there's indoor growers all going to be forever. Uh, and mm -hmm. like knowing that, accepting that and just like, okay, so what, what can I do to minimize my, in my, you know, my carbon footprint? What can I minimize to do my, uh, do my part to source locally and, and balance it out. Right. You know, so I, I understand brown sugar is coming from probably across the world and, and I buy it a couple of years knowing or a couple times a year uh, to make preparations, knowing that and like balancing it. Well, I don't want to go buy a bunch of bottled beneficial microbes. So I, you know, it's, it's a trade and it's a compromise and uh, people that are too uh, exacting in their ways and refuse to even try or attempt something new. I think that's, that's sad because there's so many, many, good aspects of so many different things that you can pick and choose what works for you, what you enjoy doing and what makes sense in your setting instead of being so like dogmatic about like, I'm only going to grow with Athena and Rockwell. And it's uh -huh. like, you're 
worldview is so narrow and that's all, all you experience and all you know. And there's so many you know subtleties and variations that you could be playing with. And like I said, it's all personal preference. And at the end of the day, what, what makes you happy and for sure. what you want to spend your time doing. 100%. You know, I'm all about the biomimicry and, and you know, using what you have and, and the going out and collecting things for free and stuff. Um, and you touched on a lot of different things. Uh, one of them was, you know, uh, going out to the grocery store and buying bananas to make um, like a nutrient, whatever. Um, I think that that's a great way for people to kind of like dip their toe in the water and just learn how to do it. Um, to me, in my mind, it's like, how much money are you spending on the actual nutrient value itself? Um, if I'm going out and I'm buying $40 worth of bananas, you know, um, why wouldn't I go buy $40 worth of like a powdered, um, amendment, you know, that I know has particular nutrient value. That's, that's just how I think. Right. Um, but I think like, you know, if you got just like a jar and you just get a thing of bananas and you just want to try it, like go for it and you're doing full your application. So you're not using much, like, I think that's cool. You know, as long as, you know, they're not covered in pesticides and you're not just introducing, you know, like glyphosate and stuff to your soil, like go for it, you know, check it out. Um, but to me, it's like, you know, I operate, it's not like a big farm, but it's not a small project either. Um, and so for me, it's like, I got to like do cost management and stuff also. So to me, like that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, I'd rather go get like Definitely. a big 40 pound bag of kelp um, or something for, for, you know, you know, potassium or whatever. Um, then, then go out and ferment a bunch of, of bananas. Um, and that's just me. Um, I'm, I'm guilty of being a little bit meticulous with, with my soil. You were talking a bit about, um, you know, we can get like really mathematical and stuff. That's like totally me. Um, you know, like I'm, I'm all about like soil testing, balancing, um, the exact like, nutrient profiles and stuff to make, make sure that like the, the proper, bonds are happening, like covalent bonds are happening to catalyze different processes to make sure that they're like immediately available and, and usable by the plant and stuff like that. Um, which is one of the reasons why I don't do Jadam. Um, and you know, it's okay that we have different views. And, and honestly, I think diversity of viewpoint is great and there's nothing wrong with it. Um, and everything works for different people for different reasons. Um, and everyone has different approaches. And I think having variation in approaches creates a variation in product. And we don't want everyone's product to be completely uniform. That's what we're running into in the industry right now, um, where everyone's running, uh, you know, cocoa blocks with Athena and everyone's product is pretty much the same. Um, you know, I have a, a, you know, a buddy, I won't talk too much about him, but he he has a selection of, of uh, hydroponic stuff that's delivered to him all the time um, for him to sample. And I go over and I look at his stuff and often a lot of the time it all smells the same. Um, and it's, I think a lot of that has to do with like this really like consistent approach that all of these farms are using and it doesn't set things aside. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about organic cultivation and living slow cultivation is that we all have like a little bit different of philosophies that we subscribe to. And that variation is a good thing. It sets our products aside from each other um, and from other people. And what draws people to try like a variation. Um, <clears throat> I've grown the same, uh, so I have multiple soils um, in my greenhouse. I have my long bed that was custom built by me, and then there were those boxes that were there before I got here um, on this property that were a completely different soil composition, and I've grown the same clone um, in both of them, and they express themselves differently. Um, and it's because of the nutrient composition, it's because of the the inputs that were used, um, it creates a variation in, in expression and like the terroir, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a good thing. I think that it's good that we have variation and expression and it brings value to the community. Um, but but yeah, like I'm, <clears throat> Jadam, yeah, Jadam, it just, it just doesn't resonate with me as much. I'm not against it per se, um, but I've just never tried it. Um, and I'm open to trying it, but, um, I am that person who's like afraid to, to, to pump in something that I don't know what it is. Um, like, I don't know the value of it. Like I can go on to, you know, like Dr. Duke's phytochemical database um, and look up the nutrient profile of lettuce or whatever I'm putrefying. Um, and it will give me a general idea, but it doesn't mean that it was grown identically to whatever they tested in the database. Right. Mm -hmm. So like I can do calculations based on this research that I have, 
but it doesn't mean that it's going to be accurate to what I'm actually doing. Um, and therefore I'm kind of like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm adding. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's just kind of just how I am. And maybe I should let go of that a little bit. Um, well, no, and I don't think necessarily. And that's what I, I've been emailing back and forth with the uh, agricultural school, Oregon state about doing some, uh, analysis and doing that and trying to establish just like a baseline. So if you use, you know, five pounds of pumpkin, five pounds of cantaloupe, 10 pounds of grass clippings, then you have, you know, you know, maybe say a five ingredient list and it's weighted and measured. And you do that, you source that from different farms, different parts of the state, uh, use the same amounts, run an average on all five of those and just try to establish like a baseline NPK for this recipe. If you, if you use this, it'll be within this estimated parameters. Uh, so it would be more approachable for people like who want to see like, well, is there zero nitrogen? Is it 50% nitrogen? What, what exactly are we going to be putting in at the end of the day? And I think that's, you know, obviously there's a, uh, a lot of success using this process that's basically their farming methodology for the last you know 2000 years so uh sure. what is the mechanism like you said let's let's find out exactly what is going on in the in the, the values at the end of the day to make it maybe more a little bit more approachable because it is uh, you know i i held on tightly to uh bottles like uh, nectar for the gods was the last bottled line that i ran and I, I loved it. I had a bunch of, I grew a bunch of good plants with it. It had some success with it. But then after I started, did like a first little no-till experiment, just like you said, that was like what, what the best organic fertilizer liquid bottle I could find at the time. And all the, all like six different varieties came out smelling like almost ex exactly the same. And that's not in a hydro setting with Athena. That's like in, in soil with theoretically a, a, a good organic nutrient line. And they all came out the same. Uh, so like you said, it's, it's, it's a huge, uh, the diversity, even uh, in, indoor, even uh, more so outdoor. Like, you know, I, I could grow a cutting on two different sides of the yard and they're going to be a little bit different, even though they came from the same mother, just because of the soil they're planted in the, you know, the few moments difference of sun or shade that they're getting in the day, all, all those subtleties come into play. And like, if you're running a sterile grow with the Athena pro line and the same cookies cuts that's coming out of California that a thousand other grows got is like, how, there's, there's no way to set yourself apart. It's all, you know, it smells the same, right. tastes the same, looks the same. It's frosty as fuck, tight nugs. I can't argue against that. I've seen right. tons of it, but. For sure. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, you know, your way to be competitive is through marketing and reducing your cost per pound and like efficiency systems, you know, like making sure that you have like run a tight ship, right? Um, and now it's like business management yeah. and not so much cultivation practices. Um, and to me, that's that's what I love, right? That's what I love about growing this plant is is the the practice of like growing the plant itself um, and not like, you know, minimizing my expenses, minimizing my, my labor, you know, minimizing, uh, cost per pound, even though that's important and it always should be considered, you know, you don't just want to be reckless with your decisions, but I feel like if you're doing cannabis cultivation, the focus should be on cultivation and growing like the best product that you can. That's like medicinal and healing, so to speak for, for people to consume. Yeah, no, and I'm, I'm not trying to show you. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not just you. I, that's we. We. You know, my family relocated from all over the states here to Oregon to grow in the rec market, and like that's all I did. I want to do marketing, and I want to do sales, and do all that. I just wanted to grow, and at the end of the day, that's like that's all I was interested in. And now, like you said, I, you made a post uh, last week, and I felt very targeted about like just pimping products and so much other shit going on. And it's like, you feel like I was targeting you. I, oh yeah. I felt, I felt super targeted. I, I'm not saying no, that you were. I'm sorry. I'm saying that it, 
no, 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 don't apologize. It was fucking spot okay. on. Like that's why I felt targeted because oh. it applied to me. I'm not, I'm not accusing you of making it specifically about me, although you could have. Oh, okay, 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 okay. It was very no, and then I was just like, you know what? I just like I just want to grow yeah it was a good it was a good kind of uh that was just something that was just kind of like weighing on on me and my heart you know was like sure like i want success in life you know everyone wants comfort and to do well um but like this is what i love to do i started doing it you know because i loved it because it like built a connect like i was able to build a connection to nature and that's like what I'm going to like start crying, <laughs> but it, it was like really healing for me in the time that I needed it. Um, and I found like passion in doing it. And then just slowly I'm like more, more promotion, more collaboration, more everything, more, more this. And now I'm like, I almost feel like, yeah, like I'm selling out. Right. I felt like I was selling out and I like, I wasn't posting for, I don't know if anyone noticed, but I wasn't posting for like two weeks. Cause I was like, I don't want to make this content. Like, this isn't what I want to do. And it's also winter time, and so I didn't have a lot of fresh new content to make. So I've just been using, like, clips from old videos and old stash videos and stuff that I've that I've had and just talk about that. Um, but, like, it just, it just doesn't, it just didn't feel good. It didn't feel right. It felt like I was just kind of, like, cheating out everyone who originally followed me for the original reasons why I was, you know, making my content and stuff. Um, and now I'm just trying to, like, almost like I was bait, bait and switching people. Um, and uh, that's not what I want. I want my content to be, you know, inspiring people to, to connect with nature through like whatever ways that they can. And I'm not, I'm not, I never want to tell people that they should and shouldn't, that their practice shouldn't, shouldn't look like anything. Um, and there are some like organic communities that are very dogmatic um, and say like, this is, you know, you can only do it this way. And like, don't question anything. <laughs> and, and like, mm -hmm. the, you know, and, and this just not, this is not for me. I want to encourage people to just like come up with new stuff, like understand the processes of how they work and make up your own shit, you know, like make up stuff, like come up with cool things, experiment with stuff. There's so many different ways to do it. You know, you can break down plant matter with enzymes. You can break it down with bacteria. You can putrefy it. You know, you can ferment it. You can, you know, and, and like one of the big things that I've uh, gotten into is like breaking down specific polysaccharides with this specific enzyme that breaks them down, you know, which is something I've been playing a lot with. And the, the, the doors are, I mean, there's just so many options when we're playing with that, like, you know, uh, harnessing like beta glucans from like mushrooms and using and finding something with beta glucanase or, or, um, you know, making like a, a, a phosphorus input by finding something with phosphatase in it and, you know, something with phosphorus or, um, chitin and chitinase, um, you know, like an insect cast or uh, uh, insect frass and, and like barley or something. Um, and like, there's just so many different things that you can do that aren't even talked about and aren't even practiced. And so like, I want people to understand how these things work and to like come up with their own stuff, come up with their own approaches and like, don't, you don't have to follow what everyone says, you know, you don't have to do only what people have tried, like go out there and like come up with stuff, like create new things, like, like do what makes sense. Like if there's a reason why someone says don't do it, maybe come up with a solution. Why, what that solves that problem. Like people talk about, like I saw it earlier in the day, someone was talking about like, don't do Hugo culture because it's going to lock up all your nitrogen. It's like, well, maybe find a way to saturate your wood with nitrogen, you know? Um, and like, there's, there's solutions. There's so many solutions to all the different problems. And and um, some people are just so quick to just get like angry and fight about it. But like, we're all on the same team. You know, I feel like we really are. Um, and it kind of sucks how divided people can be because of subscription to like strict approaches and rules that have been set aside by just how people have been doing it. You know, like this is nature, like observe nature, learn how it works yeah. and like come up with your own shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind no, of beautiful, it's, isn't it? It's funny. <laughs> I think that's one of the, well, I think that's like one of the the, the things that's like nostalgic, uh, you know, romantic, romanticize uh, growing in prohibition, like, like in the late 90s. It's like, oh, it's these the good old days and everybody stuck together. And it, which it really was, you know, it was a very small, close circle community uh, of us that, uh, you know, we were all you know i i never served any time for the plant thankfully i uh, know tons of people that have still in 
Um, so, but everyone was willing to pay that price together. You know, we were all taking a risk and that was something like the thread that binds us is what we always, what we always joked around about it. It was like something we could say in the open uh, around people. Cause it was very hot. There was like, you know, late nineties, no internet. You're not taking pictures of plants. You don't tell anybody about it. You're not showing it off. Uh, there's a handful of people you could trust with basically your freedom uh, because if someone was talking out of place and said something that you would be uh, in prison at that time. So it was a very supportive uh, group of people and anything you needed, uh, anytime, anything you needed. And like I said, and now it's like, it's just so much infighting and bickering back and forth, like organic I'm versus salts it. and indoor outdoor. And there's an argument about everything. And we're all, all divided and missing out that we're all home. Well, home growers are, that's like the, the thread that binds us. Uh, as home growers is we're all doesn't matter what what methodology you're using it's like we need to come together and organize as a united front of home growers to ensure we have the freedom to continue growing at home moving forward the next 10 years because every other entity is represented in washington dc besides the home growers you know nobody there's nobody fighting for us and our rights uh, it's all being divided up into these you know uh, the, the large large scale commercialization of it is is all that anyone is spending money on uh, which mm -hmm. which is sad and scary and uh, exciting at the same time because there's a definitely still potential for for a, a legalization but but really yeah really at, at the end of the day home growers to put up all the petty differences in the world don't matter uh, if we're not able to grow at home then it doesn't matter if it's salt or organic or whatever your preference is it's going to be shut down and uh, yeah, so it's just that, the, and I think that's like the mentality of a lot of people now <clears throat> that didn't experience that uh, period of time where it was like, grower. no, no, and even like in the you know 60s, 70s, 80s, there's always been home growers, always will be. Uh, I can't, I can't imagine trying to roll it back as many people are are involved now, but but still re restricted rights and uh, absurd licensing fees and that's all very realistic as well to make it just cost prohibitive to legally grow which is a form of uh, prohibition in itself so there's there's still a lot of a lot of hurdles ahead of us for sure um we already, we're like almost 40 minutes and we haven't even talked about our research paper yet <laughs> but i love it it's such a, we're having such an organic conversation and I, and I think it's great and we've covered some really really passionate subjects and I'd love to continue talking about it, but I think we should jump into our research paper. <laughs> How you feel? Yeah, no, no, for sure. And we, and we kind of touched on it a, a couple of months ago on another show about just the phytohormones, uh, applying those phytohormones to the root zone, the, uh, if, how effective, if that is effective at all. And that's just kind of played into, okay, well, if you're not able to uh, successfully, you know, directly apply phytohormones through a soil drench without risking those being converted uh, before they're able to be utilized. And what other ways are we able to increase the phytohormone levels of the plant uh, for, uh, you know, training purposes, or in my particular case, I was interested in, uh, you know, alternatives to synthetic rooting hormones, uh, shortening rooting times for new cuttings. So it led me to that uh, a Canadian study, uh, Sylvain, Gaudreau, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. Gaudreau, maybe. Okay. Uh, but basically talking about in uh, in uh, anticipation of taking cuttings, they would actually go through and top all the mother plants and you know remove the apical dominant top. So that would create a flood of oxen in the plant. And they would time their cuttings so that the oxen was at its peak level. And what their goal was is to reduce the veg time after cuttings uh, by uh, instigating that lateral branching earlier by taking those tops, but they found out, uh, you know, tangentially or, or just kind of a happy discovery on the side was that it decreased rooting time in those, in the cuttings that they had taken as well, because uh, the plants flooded with, with, with oxen. So that was, they were able to take off a total of two and a half weeks of their total production time just by topping the plants to increase that hormone. So things like uh, 
you know, high stress training, low stress training, even just pulling those tops down will have the same effect mm -hmm. uh, uh, of, of flooding the plant, removing the apically dominant top and causing the uh, oxen flood to send out, you know, new, new growth tops to establish a new top point. And mm -hmm. yeah, just what, what else can we do? How else can we like amplify those uh, phytohormone swings in the plants uh, to, 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 to boost, you know, it would be artificially boost, but not synthetically boosting it with, uh, you know, I think Clonex has an oxen spray that you, uh, you like missed your plants the days leading up to, to cuttings. And well, that's, that's unnecessary now if you're able to just, you know, uh, mechanically remove that apically dominant top and have a natural hormone application instead of buying a plastic bottle of synthetic rooting hormone. And that's, you know, that's the thing that always gets me is you're, you're spending a lot of money on these synthetic hormones. Like, well, what do you think they were synthesized from? It's like the, the naturally occurring hormones that are already present in the plants. Like you, like I, I never use uh, rooting hormones when I take cuttings because it's, you know, it's okay. It may speed it up a couple of days. I will argue that it, it does probably decrease the rooting time a bit if you use whatever uh, synthetic hormone, but it's not necessary. Like I, I can, I can wait a day for roots to naturally without, without any, any synthetic uh, phytohormones applied to the plant. And I understand if you're a big commercial scale production uh, schedule to stick to, that there's arguments for doing it that way, but I'm primarily speaking to the home grower now through my social media and daily interactions. I, I just, I, I'm speaking to the home grower. So all of the things that I embrace and suggest may not scale up. And, uh, and that's, you know, and that's just part of it. I understand that that's okay. Doing things at scale, uh, you start, and that's why it's, it's fine. It's like, there's, there's mm -hmm. plenty of other people out there that are speaking on, uh, mainstreaming large scale production. And I don't have to have that conversation anymore. So I focused on, you know, the home grower. And, and like you kind of said, <clears throat> you touched on it is obviously you don't want to be like, uh, irresponsibly wasting money. You're growing for yourself, uh, theoretically, so you don't have to pay the dispensary prices or you, you save money and provide yourself with clean medicine, right? So you don't just want to be wasting money willy nilly, but you are also allowed a little more room to negotiate those decisions that uh, someone with a board of investors just does not have. It's like if you want to spend the extra five dollars and maybe extra ten dollars here on this or that. Yes, that's, again, that's personal preference. And yeah, so I just think that, yeah, $10, $20 for a, a bottle of rooting hormone is probably not going to like alter your uh, end of quarter sales projections as a home grower, but it's also unnecessary. And it's something that I think that's another huge reason that I enjoy the preparations and the DI, the do it yourself style uh, stuff is just because of the gratification. It's very rewarding to. Uh, well, you know, it's very rewarding to grow your own plant from seed to harvest and then add on top of that. Well, I'm not only am I growing and nurturing this plant to health, I'm also crafting everything it needs myself. And, and you're like, you're, you're nurturing it in a much more personal and connected way. And to me, the first time that I, you know, made it all the way to a harvest with just crafted inputs was like a, a revelation. And it wasn't the biggest, I had some issues and some nutrient burn and it wasn't a perfect run at all, but it was, it was the first step up down that, that road. It, it was the, uh, you know, the, like the universe saying it's, here it is, it's possible. You just need to, you know, uh, like I said, research it. How's it working? What, what do I need to change and, and how do I go about making it as effective as possible? So uh, yeah, that's it's a the, process. It's, it's more intimate. I think it's more rewarding. That's why I love it. It's what, yeah, definitely. And like you said, and to the to whoever is maybe watching that it just got back from the store buying a bunch of bananas to make KNF. It's like that's awesome. Good, like you said, good yeah, job. I'm glad you're you're going down that road. Yeah. And I truly I believe that it, it, it's like a it's a rabbit hole. Like once you start mm -hmm. doing a couple of preparations, you're that's my experience anyways. Once I started doing those, I was like, okay, well, I don't want to go and buy this. I was like, I want to go and forage. I want to go out and collect it. And, uh, yeah. you know, then it just, so it, 
if you're buying bananas now, it's okay. You won't be in a few months. Like, yeah, find what's growing native in your environment. You know, find what you have growing, ferment it. That's it. It's free. It's probably better anyway. Um, but yeah, so Is this research paper. Like, uh, What, what were you going to say? Uh, dumpster no, diving at the no dump dump. If you don't have a garden, you can't forage. Like dumpster diving at the grocery store too. Just ask the sure. produce person when they throw their stuff out, and you can go and fill a five gallon bucket up from the grocery store, and that's that's a plenty. You know, plenty of inputs for. Yeah, I've done that. I've been there. You know, I I found the local um, uh, health food store. You know, asked them if I could just pick up all their their produce waste and fermented it up. That was a number of years ago. But yeah, that's a great approach. You know, it doesn't have to be super fresh. That's not a big deal. No, um, exactly. But okay, about about our, our research paper. Um, great, yeah. So you, you you touched on it a bit, um, but this technique is talking about topping your your mother plants before cloning them, um, which I yes. found interesting. It's something that I've never tried before. Um, let me actually bring it up. For everyone, what do you do? I know how to do this. Hold on. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, and you know, and it's a, a okay. study that was done because of commercial production, and there's not there's not any uh, home growers or hobby growers spending you know tens of thousands of dollars to do a study, so it is a bittersweet relationship with the commercial industry that is able to like do these studies and provide some information for us because uh, sorry i'm like totally scatterbrained i'm not good at focusing on multiple things at one time um so what it's talking about is like topping your mother plant um before cloning instead of doing it afterwards so you know, like the typical approach is we take our cuts, we root them, we plant them, and then after they kind of harden off a little bit and kind of get their root zones established, um, then we top them. And we like try to spread that stress over a period of time. And they have, there's like a diagram here. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they'll top it and they'll let the plant kind of recover from the topping um, and then and then cut it and clone it, right? Um, and, and, then that kinda... and then straight to flower, yeah. About... Yeah. Or I guess they're, they're vegging it for a shorter time. Right. And so that that eliminates the stress um, being like imposed on the plant in a time when it's like weak and small. And it allows this, the plant to recover from the stress while it's like larger um, and like in, you know, more soil and like a, just a bigger, hardier plant. Um, and then you immediately have two tops and the the paper kind of goes into the data behind doing it and like the increase in yields and stuff. Um, and then it, you know, it talks about um, our, oxen, our oxens and cytokinin um, impacts and whatnot. Um, but that's like, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's pretty much what it talks about. Um, what, what are some things that you, you um, found interesting in this, that's done? Well, again, it's just, you know, the commercial production trying to uh, streamline their, their or, you know, shaving off days of the production. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is something that is great to implement, like, as a, as a home grower, because you can t take and apply those same concepts to save yourself time. You don't have to be taking uh, thousands or hundreds of cuttings. Uh, these, these, and that's the other thing, like picking and choosing what works for each individual setup. And until recently, I... I had primarily grown from seed, just like very, 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 very few uh, clones I ever grew. So I like decreasing the rooting time and cutting was not something I had to consider. So if you're new or starting to propagate more of your own stuff and you're looking for ways to uh, decrease rooting time, decrease overall transition time from cutting to flowering, it's like there's some of these things that make sense to apply in your garden, especially when when it's not, uh, you're not buying another product. You know, it's a very, it's you topping your plants. You have a pair of scissors. You've got everything you, you need now to, to make yourself more successful. Uh, so yeah, so not, you don't have to take the, the entire 
cloning SOP for hundreds of, of, of cuttings. Uh, you can use this highly effective hormonal manipulation technique at home. And, and I just, I love being able to pick and choose what you can take away from, because uh, I, I feel like a lot of time there's nothing from a commercial grow that I'm like, yes, I love that. I, would, I need to bring it into my grow because it would make it better. Uh, a lot of times I feel the exact opposite is because of all the compromises that are made to be able to cut the, the increase that profit margin. Like you talked about earlier, you have to, you know, uh, evaluate those choices and, you know, you've got investors to answer to. And at the end of the day, you're, you exist to make money uh, in a commercial grow. It doesn't matter how much you love the plant or love the patient when you were growing 10 years ago. Now it's uh, for money in there. So there's a lot of, Compromises made on the commercial side of things. What's that? I agree with what you're saying, um, but I do see some some rack companies, some like living soil companies that are definitely like really passionate about their plants and stuff too. Though. Oh yeah, no, and I, I'm I'm sorry, 100. percent There's not all commercial growers are, are evil corporations. There are like there are definitely still uh, passionate people that have, that have been growing for a long time and are finally able to do it legally, and they they haven't uh, compromised on on quality. Uh, but are still able to make money. And that's, I think the, the other thing, well, on the commercial side of things, but yeah, so just back to the paper, being able to uh, recognize when those hormone uh, swings are, are, are happening. I said, they take the cutting two weeks after uh, the initial topping. So after two weeks, uh, the plant is, is at its maximum uh, content of the, of the, of the oxen phytohormone and that's when they take their cutting because it, it's it drastically decreases that rooting in, in uh, veg time yeah that's awesome yeah and and people don't often think like um you know training and pruning you know as affecting like hormones but it has a huge impact um and even things like calcium wave response um are you familiar with calcium wave response i've heard you talk about it and it seems like you do manual manipulation or like manual training uh to do that i would love to yeah. hear more about it. it's just kind of like like when you when you like train a plan out and you're kind of just like massaging it whatever it's forcing calcium into all the places that have been like damaged i guess or just um irritated you know not entirely mass like mastized but like when you bend it you know it's going to create like a wave of calcium to that area um and in turn will like affect you're not you're not talking about like uh, like breaking it like a uh, super crop so there's you're, that. Not, you're not actually like you know? no so there's that too you know like if you snap it you're gonna get like a big like calcium knot but if you mm -hmm. just if you don't snap it and you just kind of like bend like the whole thing you'll get like a wave of calcium to that area which is one of the reasons why i like to train my plants pretty flat um this time I'm actually not going to go as flat as I did this last run indoors. I think I may have went a little bit too flat. Um, and I'm curious to if that angle is going to affect water delivery. So I'm going to I'm not going to go quite as extreme this time. And I'm going to see how that affects things. Um, but yeah, that act, the action of like bending it and just kind of like irritating the cells a little bit will like rush calcium to that area. And it's called the calcium wave response. Um, and there's a million papers on it. Maybe not a million, but there's plenty of documentation on it. Sure. I, if I, I haven't tried, I haven't done it myself. I, I definitely will. Yeah, you should check it out. It's pretty cool. Just another thing to know about. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this down. This is So this is a really short read. Um, I posted it in the comments if anyone wants to check it out. Um, but yeah, it's like super short. Like this is the beginning and that's the end so it's really quick read and it's just about this technique um it's something that i'm probably going to implement here soon um i don't need to take clones right now but in the future i'm definitely going to try this um and then you know talk about it maybe make a maybe make a post you, or something do you have mothers like do you have a consistent cuttings are you are you taking uh cuttings regularly yeah i have mothers i have a mother I have two mother beds, actually. I try to have like a decent amount of soil for my moms and then I just kind of load them up with, with aminos and stuff, keep them high in nitrogen. 
that's something I'm I'm got my first my first mother's in a little veg area I just got finished out. And like this will be the first uh, extended stay mothers I've had. Like, like I said, I generally have always grown from seed. Uh, I, lo- I just I love the hunt, the endless possibilities of little seed. You just don't know what you're going to get. So it's a uh, it's going to be a bit of a change uh, of pace love- with the mothers and, and keeping the mother healthy. Sorry, I'm just turning on light in here. Um, yeah, I'm. I've been growing moms forever i do like seeds and like the vigor of seeds um and also you know over time like noticing genetic drift i think is is a real thing too um typically only if like at any time in the plant's life it does get deficiencies we can talk about that that's a whole nother conversation um but i want to talk about the genetic drift because that kind of ties right into the other thing i wanted to touch on is the hop latent viroid and like that okay. was one of the things that i is like the her, like dudding dudding uh and genetic drift and do you think genetic drift is that a legitimate thing or is that just hoplite and so, viroid that we were calling something else i mean that's an interesting point and there's i don't know um i've seen what i've experienced as dudding um i remember back in the day i got you know a gorilla glue four cut um and after i grew it for a couple of years it was not yielding like it used to right um, and mm-hmm. I um, have seen some genetics recently that were older that have been kept around for a long time, cloned off of clone, um, which I really think are not reaching their genetic potential. Um, <clears throat> what causes that genetic drift? I'm not entirely sure. To me, to me, cloning off of the clone specifically, I don't see why that would create genetic drift unless the plants were just losing health over time like if you if you cut off a a deficient plant i could see that because you know like dna is uh it's an acid right um Mm -hmm. you know just like an amino acid you know i forget what dna stands for i know rna is ribonucleic acid ribose yeah something yeah but it's an acid right and you know all of these have cofactors all of these organic acids or, you know, acids in general, they all have an enzymes and everything. And they all have cofactors, right? Which are our nutrient profiles. Um, and this is speculation, um, but this is just kind of what I've pondered about, right? Um, is if you don't have all the cofactors to biosynthesize particular things in the plant, then they're going to break down, right? So, you know, terpenes have cofactors. They have, you know, they require iron. They require enzymes, they require, you know, trace minerals and so on, everything, right? Um, and if they're not present, those things won't be synthesized. They won't be biosynthesized in the trichome head and they just won't exist, right? So to me, DNA is not this thing that just is going to be there no matter what. And I feel like if you have too much stress, if you don't have proper nutrition, it's very possible that the sequences of DNA break down. Um, I've also seen though, ironically enough, um, regenerating uh, a plant from genetic drift, from cloning off of the apical meristem only. So like you go mm. grow it out perfectly healthfully. So like, okay, say you get a, a clone that has genetic drift. You throw it in a, an abundance of soil, right? You let it grow, you make sure that it's perfect, and you cut the apical meristem specifically only. And then you grow only the apical meristem. And then you do it again and you do it again, and you do it again, and eventually you'll see that genetic revitalize itself. I've seen it a few times, um, that, and that's like they, it, they talked. About that's it. exactly how you. That's exactly how you clean a plant up from hop and viroid, is because it's not present mm-hmm. in the, the new growth. So you 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 let it, like you said you let it grow eight inches, take a top clone, let it root and grow, and take a few successive top cuttings, and you basically are running away from the virus. Right, because it's via the major viral load is in the root mass, and it is slowly trans uh, transported to the new growth tip. So that's how they'll clean a plant that the you know it's too good to let go. So you're going to send it to the lab and clean it. So they'll grow it out, I grow remember. it out, and take like six successive cuttings, and then tissue culture the very top of the sixth or seventh cutting. So that sounds like exa- exactly like. I've never heard uh, that before. That's really really interesting. Um, you know. 
Maybe it's one, maybe it's the other, maybe it's both. You know what I mean? I know. I, I, I want to uh, know. It's terrifying. We talk, They talked about uh, life cycle botanicals up in Canada uh, two weekends ago, and it's it's terrifying. Like, hoplite and viroid is, it's no joke. It's hard to get rid of when it's around. Uh, mm -hmm. If it's in your soil, you're fucked. Uh, well, that's an interesting like, thing. It's a no-till growth. No. no, no, and that's why I, right. I, we talked about before we went we on. keep our soil around, around forever, right? Um, but from what I, I understand... Like I said, I had... But, <laughs> um, from what I understand, it requires a living host, um, like living tissue to exist in. Um, so I feel like I've also heard people say that it will exist in dead decomposing organic matter. But from the research that I've seen is it requires a living host to, to exist. Um, so I feel like if you chopped and you let your soil rest for a period of time where your root systems completely broke down, um, you didn't have fresh plants in there. I feel like the soil wouldn't have it in it. Um, I am not a virologist. <laughs> I'm not a plant pathologist. <laughs> um, maybe we should bring one on here. But to me, instinctually, you know, viruses require hosts. Um, you know, you have COVID, you sneeze on something, it's not going to stay there forever, right? Um, it requires a living host. Um, and I feel like that would be applicable to plants. Again, I'm not a plant virologist. Um, but I want to know, I want to know as well, people, oh, because, yeah. Yeah. Like, like, sometimes people even, really get the best of them too. Yeah, for sure. Cause I leave, I, I leave root balls too. You know, I let them break down naturally. Um, let the worms and, and critters get to them. Um, and then rip them out when I'm going to plant. And then I like to plant directly in the same hole, you know, keep the uh, mycorrhizal networks intact, you know, where the roots were and just kind of plant there. And then they kind of immediately connect back into them. And, um, uh, but if that's perpetuating hoplite and viroid, then that's really bad, right? That's not what we want. Um, but I also think sometimes people's fear gets the best of them. Um, and it's like, we can't beat this thing that's going to destroy everyone. And I remember back in, um, you know, like 10 years ago or whatever, um, everyone, you know, russet mites were impossible to kill and they're going to take over and they were planted by the government to, to kill, to, 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 to kill all the cannabis plants. Um, and like people got kind of got carried away and they're in the chemtrails and like, you know, um, <laughs> sometimes, People, you know what I mean? Like sometimes people get carried away with with like their 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 fear, um, and and I think cannabis growers by nature kind of like don't trust the government. Maybe I'm making an assumption, but they're typically kind of independent thinking individuals. Um, but it'll it'll be fine. I'm sure that we'll figure it out, and it's not going to like completely destroy the entire cannabis industry. Um, but yeah, sure. Like use precautions. You know, like clean your scissors um use you know plants from tissue culture you know always be wary of clones coming from other people um make sure that you know the breeders that you choose are, are growing from like tissue culture and stuff um like the the, the skunk uh, breeding project that we're doing like everything that i got was all from tissue culture and and i made sure to let the the bed rest all the way you know for months and months and months without you know plants growing in it and stuff um, just because of what I understand how viruses work and, and the research that I did on hoplite and viroid. Um, because that's, less, that's the last thing you want, you know, like imagine like growing a big seed harvest and distributing hoplite and viroid to everybody. Like, what a nightmare. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, but there, there's, plenty of, there's plenty of seed companies that are producing seeds down in Colombia. And Colombia is just as infected as California is. And that if, if it's over 50% transmission rate from an infected mother and like something like 70% transmission rate from an infected father. And that's kind of what opened my, like re re attuned my self to like preparing for or doing, putting some precautions in place as a home grower for hoplite and viroid, because even if we're growing from seed, if, like you said, if you're not researching the breeder, researching where those seeds were produced, uh, that are there tests available for those, uh, the, the parents of those seeds, they, you know, it's, it's risky just buying random seeds and cuttings off of somebody from somewhere and sure. shipping it in from, from who knows where. So we're not, we're not immune as, as home growers. And like you said, cleaning, cleaning your tools. And like, I hate bleach. Don't particularly 
like to use it around uh, the house for any other reason. Always clean my scissors with ISO and come to find out that it's not not effective against hoplite and viroids. So now like, I'm taking the precaution. I'm using bleach and cleaning my cutting tools and uh, cleaning in between runs with the more caustic solutions that I would generally prefer to. But also that goes back to the compromise of like the reality of growing. It's like everything's not exactly how I would have it designed in a perfect scenario necessarily, but the realities of growing and wanting to maintain a healthy environment and doing my part to limit the spread of this is, you know, just part of it. Yeah. It's a very serious thing, you know, and not everyone has the, the ethics <laughs> to um, prioritize something like that, but it's crucial. No. And it's company reputation destroying, like <laughs> you gotta be, like, everyone's gotta be careful. Well, right. Like this. Is yeah. Thing. And not only, not only the, people's reputation who are like knowingly or even unknowingly that's worse i think unknowingly selling that infected stuff is just the mm -hmm. uh think about you know the farm that gets it's barely existing from harvest to harvest and they got two thousand cuttings that, that that dud out on them or whatever happens and they're not able to get to a successful harvest it's like not only is like your biz bad business reputation uh destroyed yourself but you also destroyed probably a, a small business owner and like people that exist on those narrow margins aren't able to like miss a harvest. It's every, every harvest is imperative. So, yeah. Yeah. The exact people that we're trying Dude. to lift up, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So yeah, do your, do your research. Don't just uh, take seeds and cuttings in from anywhere. Right. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I believe that you can, test seeds for hoplite and viroid before they're distributed also, which is a precaution that 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 we're for sure going to take. Um, but yeah, that would be horrible. Like I said, I just, I did, I did some seeds for Frank as well. And it was like, like they all came from tissue culture and he, he's one, like he's yeah. one of the very few that not only is he doing it now, he has been doing it for a very long time. So he, he's been proactive and, like, I feel like that's probably a reason all of his stuff is clean. It's like, it's, it's maybe a new, a new practice for a lot of these people, but it's something he's very familiar with and done uh, as an SOP for himself for a decade, I think is what he said. He's been doing the tissue culture and it's wild. It's just responsible, you know, it's responsible and it's good, good business ethics. A hundred percent. Yeah. No, I, I, I love Frank. He, he's, he's got a, he's got to figure it out for sure. He's a good guy. I haven't met him in person yet, but I've talked to him a good number of times now. I got a whole bunch of cannabis friends. Bicycle on the, I, know, it's a, I got to ride a bicycle on the Golden Gate Bridge with him. Uh, so did, oh, yeah? We got to hang out in San, yeah, mm -hmm. we got to hang out in San Francisco for... Was it on Bicycle Day? Yeah, well, it was a, a magical bicycle day, as a matter of fact, yeah. Yeah, cool. Right on. Oh, no, what, what, was it on... It wasn't on a, 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 an official bicycle day. Is that what you said? Never mind. Do you oh, know okay, bicycle so days? Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, no, I guess not. Okay. <laughs> we won't talk about it. No. It was lost on me. But sorry. cool. This, no, it's all good. Um, but that's awesome. Yeah, he's, he's a good guy. Um, I'm sure I'll be meeting him very soon. <sighs> no, that's another thing. It's like we're, we're not too far apart and haven't met. And I'm going to meet a bunch of people from all like local, a couple of people that live within hours of me uh, in Spain next week. It's, it's wild to meeting all these people in such a faraway place, but I've got a lot of cannabis friends that I haven't met either. Yeah. I've met very few of my cannabis, my online cannabis friends in person. I actually don't even know if I've met any of them. Oh, hmm. Whatever. But we should meet. Yeah, we should meet each other. We're, we're not too far. We're like three hours away from each other. No, I know. If I could ever get over to the mountain and ski, I'll definitely definitely make it a point. Yeah, we should go snowboarding or skiing. I want to smoke some of that, I want to smoke some of that lunar cheese. Yeah, I got some. Oh, it was right there. Anyway, but yeah, my harvest right now, oh my God, it's so good. It's so good. Nice. You got to try it. You got to try it. It's like fucking got phenomenal. To phenomenal everyone who's tried it has just been like blown away by it and nothing but raving reviews so i'm really stoked excellent 
Yeah, super stoked on it. Looking forward. Um, so, so we're like hour 10 minutes. How much time do you have, Heston? Uh, I got another few minutes. Probably not crazy amount of time much left, but okay. Well, we can do jump into qu questions. Do some questions. Q and A. Yeah, questions anybody's... usually last like 15, 15, 20 minutes, depending on on the intensity of the questions and whatnot. All right. All right, everyone. We're gonna do questions. Hit us with your questions. Um, anything about you know what we discussed today, or even not about what we discussed today, but we touched on so many things between vital hormones, training, rooting, viruses. <laughs> um, so maybe we won't set like a, a hard limit on the questions. Um, but I usually like to do around five. And uh, you lower light intensity. Okay. Uh, do you lower uh, do you lower light intensity around week eight and nine and how much? Do you like to do that, Heston? I do. I I, I think that I that's uh, pretty much you're ripening at that point. Uh, mm -hmm. Bulking up's done. You're not doing too much too much growth. Uh, I think that that's time to start bringing the temperature down. The daytime and nighttime temperature starts coming down, and definitely bring it down to like. I'd say under under 800 for sure, depending on, on uh, the cultivar and you know the light and location and everything. But yeah, go from and, and, and to be, honestly, I'm not I'm not running much over a thousand. Uh, I'm running CO2 and like I have the biggest issue burning my plants with LEDs. Like I never ever burn a plant with an HPS bulb ever, and I just keep underestimating the intensity. Uh, of the LEDs, so I I keep it around a thousand. You know, week four, week four through six, I uh, probably got like 1,100, 1,200 ppm uh, CO two and a thousand, maybe a thousand and change. And then yeah, week six, drop it way back. Cool. Yeah, I usually do it around week seven, um, and I drop it to like what just seventy five percent of whatever I was running at the peak point usually. Um, and I like to drop my temps too, in like the last week. Um, I'll drop them down to like 68. Do you ever do that? Oh yeah, yeah. So like in the last like two weeks out, I'll go down into like low 70s nighttime temperature. I generally run right mm -hmm. just right, right around 80. Uh, and I don't I don't like to do big swings before the last week. But then like the last week, I'll just leave. I'll turn my air conditioner down to like 60. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't get that you cold because the de yeah so, uh, oh, okay. really, you know, it'll dip down to like you know 66 68 and that's probably my coolest as I, I get it indoor yeah that's that's about what I'm doing too um, okay I'm paying attention do you like what do you what do you max out your PPFD <laughs> I don't even really pay attention to my PPFD that much no. um but but I do have a light meter and I have been meticulous about it before um, and usually around a thousand, you know, 800, 2000. Yeah. I always hear people like 1200 PPFD, 1200, uh, CO2. I feel like that's reserved for, uh, soilless media and, and being able to like really feed hard because I've, I've had some just gorgeous plants, nothing in it and start once the light intensity hits over a thousand and the PPFD, I feel like the, like the living soil just can't quite keep up with the requirements of the plant. And they start to look hungry and sad if I push it too hard. So it's like my ceiling is like a thousand That's, PPFD, so I we, think any more than that. We talked about this on last week's episode um, with, with Benjamin and Katie, uh, um, uh, like leaf transpiration rates, because we talked about vapor pressure deficit. Um, and one of the interesting points that he brought up that I hadn't considered much um, was the ability for the soil to let go of moisture. Um, and that if you have a lot of organic matter, um, the soil itself will hold on to the moisture um, and the plant will want it faster than the soil can actually give it to the plant um, and will create like an, like that, it'll create like trans evaporation in the leaf surface and you'll start to see cl uh, like clawing and you won't see nutrient delivery happening properly and you'll see what look like deficiencies um, when it's just like too much organic matter in your soil. Um, so that's just what kind of popped into mind um, with that. So I'm actually considering building soil with less organic matter because I've I've pumped my soil with like 20% earthworm castings for a while now. Um, 
and I'm kind of thinking I'm I should drop it down and see see how how that goes. Um, yeah. Um, okay. Uh, is the nitrogen we'll clot only a result? Air. What? No, what no, no just, it, it, uh, that bump up your aeration. You're, you're just gonna like you're you're not going talking about going yeah. soilless. You're just gonna decrease or again just put a bunch more much more aeration in. Pretty much, yeah. Um, is the nitrogen clot only a result of too much nitrogen, or could it be something else? So, nitrogen clot um, that's oft often like nitrogen toxicity, right? Um, it's like overwatering is the only thing that can get kind of a similar <laughs> curl, but it's not the same shape leaf as like the nitrogen toxicity is more of taco folded in half, pointed down, and like the down over. Right? Water is a flat group, but right. Yeah, it's the nitrogen toxicity seems to be pretty unique. So all, obviously, it's tough to make a possible. diagnosis with a single picture of a curled leaf, but right, or with like a single sentence. Um, so I mean, I'm I'm just gonna be honest and be like, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have picked that question, but um. <clears throat> That's like nitrogen toxicity, right? Which is usually from having too much nitrogen um, or like anaerobic conditions um, with too much nitrogen. So could it be something else? I'm sure that there's other things that are gonna mimic that appearance. So, I mean, it's gonna, it really depends on like what exactly the plant looks like. Um, sorry, I didn't have a better answer for you. Um, you know, it's like russet mites can make a pretty gnarly leaf curl as well speaking of russet mites but yeah definitely yeah and you can see that like downward curl also with russet mites but um have you ever noticed that the longer you keep a cutting the more difficult for new clones to take um yeah i have i think that has to do with like loss of vigor though over time too what do you think huston well i i'd probably i don't I'm not gonna speak i haven't had the the number of cuttings under my belt that I think it's uh, or a mother plant to keep long enough to know if that's something that that is that is real that I have to battle. For sure, like I, said, I, I um, take cuttings maybe take cutting and, and run it again in flower, but I haven't I haven't kept mother plants ever before. So, okay, um, the big factors for slow rooting are usually mother health. Um, so I always like to keep my mothers in an abundance of soil and make sure that you're not taking cuts when like the stems are purple or when you're seeing any deficiencies at all. Um, and that's really what like affects your, your rooting speed. Yeah, definitely. That's it, even if the few cuttings that I do take, obviously I, want to have a, a healthy, vibrant, fast-growing plant. A, a sickly, droopy plant is obviously going to present some difficulties getting it to root. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if they don't have the energy they need to create those roots, then they just won't. How are you? What? I don't know what that means either. Uh, some of these questions aren't complete sentences, and I don't know what they mean. Y'all are silly. What is what are with these questions? Borax and compost tea. It's also my favorite strain to grow or consume. Those are two different things. Think about it. What is your favorite cultivar currently? What about you, Hassan? Well, like, like I said, to grow or consume because they're different. To consume, Jacarare. Like, uh, man, I just really enjoy that terpene pro profile and the experience uh, all around. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, great one. Yeah, that's a good one. Timeless it's not, classic. Not the best to grow, though. Like sour diesel, it's great to to smoke. Yeah, not I wanna, the best to grow. I want to grow it. When we're growing, I want to trim it. Um, That's like, yeah, I've kept, I've kept this particular cutting around. This will be the fourth grow in a row. 
and I, I just keep around because it's so easy to trim. It's like it's just like you, you put it in a jar and give it a little little tumble shake. It's, it's trimmed. So, yeah, yeah, that's done. Yeah, that's always nice. Um, for me, I'm kind of like out of the the pool of typical cultivars that I grow because I grow mostly stuff that I've made. Um, and I feel like I'm, if I'm just gonna like hype myself and like be like, oh, my favorite thing is what I've made. I feel like that's kind of skeezy. But um, <laughs> um, I mean, I love growing my moon diamonds, um, but I love smoking my raspberry moon cheese. Um, yeah, but in the past when I've grown um, other people's cultivars, um, I really loved animal cookies uh, to grow and smoke. Um, I had like a blackberry kush that was fucking awesome um, to grow. And I always loved Gorilla Glue. You know? It's kind of like a generic whatever, but it got so okay. blown out. Oh, and Green Crack. Did you ever grow Green Crack? That was I was in Rhode Island for Green Crack and Blue Dream. I was like, Man, I was on the East yeah. Coast for that, and oh, I was never a huge fan of Green Crack. It was okay, but like I said, I'd rather have uh, like Jack Herrera if I'm gonna do something like that. Uh, it would just yield. It was oh, a yeah. smoke and yield, you know. Yeah, yeah. same same with Blue Dream. Was like, mm -hmm. God, that was just awful, but yeah, it it was a monster. I remember when it's like I have I have a uh, saturated with it an aversion i have like an aversion to almost all blueberry now because uh for a year that's like all that i grew smoked like edibles dabs everything was blue dream i just like had so much of it now if i smell something with blueberry in it it's like i just get queasy all over i can't really? even do it it's it's huh. wild yeah I, huh. I overdid it on the blue dream yeah i don't really like smoking sativas so i don't really really grow them very much or work with them kind of like it to I like weed to put me to sleep. I like smoking it at night when I'm like gonna play video games or something. So I don't really press the at all. Yeah. Anyway, um, lost tonight. Horizontal system. Oh, uh, that was you for oh, for YouTube. Oh, sorry, I clicked this one on real quick. Um, Wasp Knight, have you used Wasp Knight before? I have not, no. So it's a source of calcium that isn't going to, um, like spike your pH as much as, um, uh, like calcium bicarbonate, like a lime, you know? Um, it also has mm -hmm. like silica in it. Um, so it's a good source of silica and it's not going to spike your, uh, your pH too high when using it. Um, I think it's like two thirds of what um, the alkali property, like the basic properties that um, calcium bicarbonate has. Um, so yeah, I use it. I like it. It's a good one. Um, you know that form of silica isn't immediately available, which is something you should you should keep in mind. Um, but it's a good input. It's a mineral. What the fuck? Oh my god. <laughs> you people. Oh, well, I've definitely <laughs> smoked brickweed before. I smoked brickweed recently, as a matter of fact. Um, people are talking about pineapple on pizza and. Um, Yeah, I smoked brick weed back in the day, for sure. It was horrible, but that's what we had. And smoked it, Oklahoma, coming up fresh. That's why I was like, the first time, like as an adult, that I heard someone describe cannabis, like, oh, you gotta smell this gas, this this fuel. <laughs> I was like, why, why, why on earth would you want to smoke fucking cannabis? Smell like fuel because we would get brick weed that had been smuggled across the border, like wrapped up in uh inside of gas tanks and shit. So oh, you get a God. you get a pound brick and you get a pound brick, and like the outside three eighths you would have to shave off because it was like all 
brown and had absorbed the fucking gas from the tank. Oh, it's it was... fucking disgusting. Yeah. That's disgusting. Yeah. That's gnarly. And when you yeah. smoke it, it just yeah, like lights so on fire. <laughs> no, it wouldn't light a fire. The, the, yeah, well, the outside, the, the outside crust, you had to, you had to make edibles or something with that. It was not, not something you wanted to taste. No, no, no. I'm glad I was yeah, not was around like, for this. And like, there's this funny, like, cons like a uh, misconception. We, you know, growing up in teenagers and there was brickweed and there was dro and dro was just like a slang for good weed, like uh, not brickweed. Anything that wasn't brickweed was dro. So like we always thought it was like dro hydroponic. It was grown in hydroponic. So we had that mentality in Oklahoma in the late nineties, early two thousands of like quality cannabis was grown hydroponically. And mm -hmm. uh, that was like my, when I was moving away from Oklahoma at that time and my, my little group of growers and stuff was like really leaning into that. And then years later when Oklahoma legalized cannabis, medical cannabis, you know, people hit me up to do this, like, Hey, like help set up a hydroponic grow. And I had, I should, you know, I talked to five or six of my, relatively close friends uh, that were setting up hydro grows the first year of Oklahoma. And I tried to talk them out of it, tried to talk them out of it. And every single one of them got rid of their hydro gear and are all like organic soil growers, like after the first season, uh, because once you got past that, like misconception of like, Oh, wait a second, that was just, you know, the, the nostalgia and the childhood connections. I think that uh, it's fine. People in these newly legalized States are all, excited and full of life and energy and just cynical as fuck over here in Oregon. <laughs> and, uh, been through it, seen the legalization. Uh, I've seen how it plays out. And I just like, I, I, I love seeing all the, the people standing in line for dispensary openings. The, like the first time they've been a dispensary and it, it's really cool. I, I, I'm glad that people still are able to cultivate that level of joy internally. Cause I'm dead inside after fucking <laughs> the OLCC will kill your soul. I'm dead inside. The, the life is gone from the, me. The, yeah. The OLCC is no joke. Still passionate. Um, I think we, what, we've done three or four questions. Um, uh, so to my point. Blue cheese, the greatest strain of all time. Nice. Is your uh, lunar cheese, is that got blue cheese in the lineage no no it has it's got blueberry your favorite and uk cheese in it nice nice said uh, blueberry on kryptonite and then uk cheese fucking love uk cheese that was oh that was a, such a great one. Oh, it was such a killer it's such a killer For as long as it was cut from, yeah, yes, okay, we can talk about this one. All right, will a clone stretch as much in flower as the mom it was cut from that was started from seed, typically? Yeah, the, gen the genetic is what is going to like be responsible for that stretch. And so, if you have a plant that's showing a lot of stretching as a mom, yeah, you can expect that in the clone for sure. Pretty straightforward question. Um, what do you think about me starting a soil cooking in an oven shop? <laughs> We're just going to bring this up just because it's funny. All right. What do you think about restarting soil cooking in oven and starting over, please? I don't know if you're serious or not, so I'm sorry if it feels like I'm making fun of you. But um, no, you don't put your soil in the oven. Soil cooking is just, That's not what um, cooking your soil is. <laughs> no. No, it's just a term. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to make fun of you. Um, but... Uh, no, that, honestly, cooking is a bad word for it, right? Um, it just, you know, when there's like nitrogen present and like during the nitrogen cycle and stuff, as nitrogen breaks down, it's going to create heat. Um, uh, and that process of it heating up and then cooling back down is called cooking. Um, but you do not, you do not want to put your soil in the oven and cook it. I mean, I, unless they're talking about if they have a pest and they're trying to sterilize it maybe and then just using it as a base to re-amend and starting a new soil, maybe, but... I wouldn't even I have that. I would just throw it away. Baked it. Yeah, I've never no, baked, I did, baked my soil. I did bake a whole bunch of uh, 
wood chips for mulch after those goddamn roly polies invaded my garden. Uh, Dude, I, I baked it. Pods can be I baked it monsters. Good yeah, those guys. Those guys are. They can be little demons. Those were honestly the like I, I battled like I picked up a thousand cuttings in three inch nursery pots that were infected from soil to the top with russet mites uh, in 2020 for an outdoor grow. And I would rather deal with that again than ever have to deal with the peel bug infest infestation in my bed. Those you things know works, were though? unbelievable. Yeah, they're, they're, but, they suck. Um, so just like if you cut the, like the butt off of a solo cup, and like a little slit mm -hmm. on the side and you surround the base and then you bury it, they can't climb up the solo cup. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Good yeah, call. Good. And that, that was my issue is like, they were fine uh, until the canopy choked out the cover crop or the living mulch and there was no, nothing for them to eat. So they started girdling the plants and climbing up in the canopy. And that was that four by eight bed. I ended up tearing the, the wooden mulch out and like shop vacuuming the top two inches of soil out and all around the that's edge. Like, it was wild. And I yeah, still that's didn't, like what didn't you have to do. You remove them. Because they're not insects. They're crustaceans. You know? So like pesticides and stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah, they're like, down. Yeah, that the, the, like would, would typically attack insects. Like the mode of action that, that kills insects, it's not applicable to them because they're not insects. They're crustaceans. Which is like, right. you know, what are, people don't make products to kill crustaceans. It's just not something that people do. Um, no, so, yeah, not, they're, not a lot of need for it. But yeah, people, no, not I tried the corporation killing. I tried beer, beer traps, uh, the potato slices, like put, put a potato slice down and then wait until they're all attached to it and like knock it off knock in a bucket to slowly remove them. And people are Which like, well, just, just squish them, but just squish them between your fingers. It's well, like, it doesn't uh, work when there's thousands of them. Millions. I don't. I don't have the soul to sit and murder individual right. bugs. <laughs> I'll tell you, that's like that, that, I, I like that weighs on your bugs. soul after a while. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's like, struggling and dying in between your fingers over and over for hours. What a horrible thing yeah. to do. Yeah, yeah, that's not. Yeah, that's not in like that, 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 <laughs> Even like if I see them and I, like I step on them, I'm like, Ugh, I'm a bad person, <laughs> killing things. Um. <clears throat> How do you kill pill bugs? Yeah, we were just talking about that. Um, chickens that you haven't fed cannabis plants to, maybe. I've seen people put ducks in their stuff. Um, lizards and frogs. I'm setting up a, a little frog pond in my um, uh, in my greenhouse this year. Because, I, one, I fucking love frogs. They're like one of my favorite little animals. Um, but uh, they're going to help control the the population of of isopods and stuff too because i've seen a bloom recently as well um i've heard scorpion or uh not scorpions uh centipede stone centipede i've heard uh, really? also prey on I'm pill bugs i'm gonna have to look that up i'll do that later I earth. Just, yeah, in, remember the diametation earth around the uh, base <laughs> of the plant I hear that for I hear that for a lot of stuff, and it always uh, in the bed in the living soil bed. I've never had success. It just ends up caked and moist, no matter where I put it, or uh, try to you know scoop the mulch back away from the base of the plant, and then put diametaceous earth around. And it's just it, it cakes up and it's useless they, almost immediately. Right, and they crawl over it. It like does nothing. They're just too yeah. Well, once it's wet, it doesn't like it's supposed to be. Wet fine dry powder to get in their exoskeleton or whatever and cut them up but like it's it's wet and caked almost instantly mm -hmm. um, sure we'll do this do you guys use insect frass i love insect frass it's one of my favorites for sure yeah 100 percent. like you said the the chitin and the uh, nutritional profile but then also just like Black soldier flies may be my next little rabbit hole to go down because oh, we're, so cool. we're gonna bring in chickens back. And yeah, getting chickens back into my life and the the black soldier fly larvae are super versatile, like vermicomposters. And then you can feed them, use them as uh, livestock, feed your livestock, chickens, fish, food, and mm 
that's going back to like my outdoor spot and further closing that loop. Uh, yeah, man, I, uh, one of the things that I'm missing most from my growing life is uh, fish. I, we had a stocked fish pond at a, a farm up in Tillamook and irrigated mm -hmm. from the fish pond. I, I really believe that's like such a huge overlooked uh, benefit. And it's, you know, 100%. even in small scale, like a fish tank, I think would have add value to any garden. Uh, but being able to actually good. draw hundreds of gallons of water from uh, from a, a stocked fish pond, and then it's like I said, you're you're, you're eating the eggs, you're the using the shells for, for calcium, you're uh, mm -hmm. using the chicken, you know, for fertilizer, uh, mm -hmm. feeding the fish, using fish for F F FAA, eating the fish fillet. So it's like another uh, like layer of like sustainability and closing. Yeah, like exactly. <clears throat> Um, yeah, that's something I've always wanted to do too, is have like a, like a little aquaponic, you know, tank, whatever with tilapia in it. And then you feed black soldier fly to it. You have like a black soldier fly bin. Um, and then yeah, you feed them to the chickens and stuff. You can just like close that loop even more. And aquaponics is like one of the best ways to get like nitrogen, um, fixing, um, bacteria, just like, um, and introducing it to your soil, you know, just more diversity of biology and stuff too. Um, that's something I, I've wanted to do also. Maybe I'll maybe I'll pull the trigger on that this year. Um, but yeah, that's a really cool one. Um, and then you have like, or then you have insect fast too, which is great. Um, I really like what um, and that was the Bobby original Taylor stuff with all of his insect fast fast uh, composting and things. The who, who? Have you seen that? Okay, Calix. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that's what, of, uh, I was going to ask you too. Have you seen uh, Ch Chapel or Sh Chapel Farms over here in McMinnville? They're uh, they were on no. they were on one of the Shark Tank or one of those things that got funded. But they're basically uh, black soldier flies, uh, incorporating those into municipal waste facilities and like diverting organic matter uh, to be like black soldier fly food, basically, and then using the cool. soldier fly larva as uh, selling that as uh, livestock feed, basically, and then selling the vermicompost that they create to the local outlet, local outlet for that. So, uh, so it's like, like almost no overhead. The black soldier. Or labor. No, that's a that's a fantastic. No, you're, and you're getting and making money to you're making money to get rid of it. Right, they're paying you to take that organic waste, and then you're selling it the byproducts. So you're making money twice instead of paying for right. inputs and then selling your product you're you're getting paid to, to to take the material and you need to create a product to sell so that's scalable at home like you can go to your grocery store like back to the dumpster diving at your grocery store uh that's something that, uh, you can do in a small yeah all you have to do is add yeah. add organic material to it and uh that's super cool so yeah so i i do yeah i think that they're uh super versatile and important part of the garden that I want to really start to uh, implement in a better way. I should do that too. Black soldier five larva bin and aquaponic tank. Just get like an ICB yeah. tote. I'll try to pull it off. Yeah. I have so many things I'm always doing, but I should try. I should do that. That sounds like fun. What? Yeah. I love, love keeping fish as well. It's nice. Uh, Yeah. Nice to have yeah, them. Then you They're non judgmental. They don't talk back. <laughs> like the plants. Exactly. Um, Darkling yeah. beetles. Yeah, beetles are a good good way to do it too. Dark. Um they kind of they eat like flesh and stuff too, like um like black soldier fly larva well. Oh gosh. Gotcha. <clears throat> um well we're about Hundred minutes in. Um, you want to call it? Yeah, if there's any more last minute questions, that's a good. Well, I don't good see anything. Jump off. I don't see anything really coming in. Well, this was awesome. We did. We had like a, this was like a genuine conversation. I had a lot of fun having with you. Um, we covered some really cool stuff. I thought this was a really solid episode. Thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. 
Always, uh, mm. yeah, always pleasure to pick your brain. Yeah, and I like that. You know, we have like similar philosophies, but we do things a little bit different, and that's cool. And we can be like cordial about it. Which I also think is that's what I was going to say as well. Like I think that's like important as adults to uh, be able to have conversations and not have to agree about everything, but still maintain civility and, and, and respect for each other. Mm -hmm. And it's like one of my favorite uh, social media personalities, Shark Mouse Farms, and we disagree on almost every single thing, but it's always like a healthy debate. And I feel like I always walk away like gaining a different perspective on something that I thought I understood well. And, and I think that he, you know, he's in a similar situation. It's like, you don't have to fight and choose a side. It's okay to compromise and learn and move forward and change your perspective. And mm -hmm. yeah, no, thank you. Always, <clears throat> yeah, different appreciate your information. Mm -hmm. You're always thank dropping you awesome much. nuggets of information. So yeah, I, I, yeah, I felt like we had a very good, Recipro reciprocative conversation um, and I had a lot of fun. I just felt genuine and comfortable. So thank you for coming on. Um, and is there anything you want to plug? You want to like hype yourself or anything you're doing right now? Oh yeah, shameless self-promotion. I'm doing the uh, Grandmaster media. level, sending us to Barcelona for Spanibus. So it's my first time making the trip across the big pond to Europe and super excited, nervous. You know, terrified. Uh, going to be an awesome time, I'm sure. So, I'm going to be judging the uh, Autoflower Cup. And I'm super stoked on that. See nice. what kind of uh, European Autoflower uh, samples you get to check out. So, yeah, big trip to to Barcelona. That's that's on my radar. Awesome. I wish I was going. <laughs> Someone take me to Barcelona. Um, I want to go out there. Definitely. Maybe one day. Next, next year next year hopefully we'll see we'll see um cool well yeah thanks man i'll catch you around thank you thanks everyone for watching okay bye thanks